Hi everyone, Brian here. Happy to welcome you to session two of our Bible study for the winter of 2022. We're now plunging right into scripture itself. And this year, rather than looking at a single book, we're going to be looking at pretty big chunks of stories from various books of the Bible. And they will carry us on that journey that the Eucharistic prayer calls the history of our salvation. Almost every Eucharistic prayer, when it inaugurates that story, begins with understanding our covenant relationship with God. And that covenant relationship happens uh, through Abraham and very specifically for us, through the experience he had with his wife, Sarah, and the birth of their son, Isaac. So we recognize that God worked in the lives of both Abraham and Sarah. Uh, I want to show you something you'll be seeing for the rest of the sessions. It's a copy of the Holy Bible that I found in our sacristy. It's a great copy. I love big, chunky, heavy uh, uh, copies of the Bible uh, because it, it reminds us that the Bible is really bigger than all of us. It should be, you know, sort of hefty. It should uh, remind us that it contains uh, the heritage that we have, that yes, we should be reading and talking about and coming to some conclusions about, but that it was both uh, created by and written down and edited and prayed over by many generations of faithful Jews and Christians before us. And uh, therefore, I love these big chunky Bibles. Uh, I found it buried in a cupboard at the back of the sacristy because it's literally too big for us to use on the, uh, on the somewhat small podium we have for the pulpit. Uh, you never know, perhaps sometime in the future we'll get a big enough podium that this can sit on because I would love to see the readers each and every Sunday morning uh, coming up and instead of reading out of a lectionary book, again, produced by the Episcopal Church so that uh, each reading for each Sunday is laid out for us immediately. But wouldn't it be great to watch somebody walk up, be in the presence of this book and have to open it to the page they wanted and then for that second reading, maybe to go all the way to the back of the church and read from another section. Uh, I love this book. It is uh, what we call the NRSV, which is the New Revised Standard Version. This is the official version used by the Episcopal Church uh, in all of our liturgies. The Revised Standard Version was done by a group of uh, scholars from a, a wide spectrum of denominations with lots of scholarly work uh, to try to bring the uh, Bible uh, out of its some archaic understandings and in line with some of the newer uh, discoveries of manuscripts and ancient uh, Greek sources and Hebrew sources so that we could understand perhaps uh, the translations a bit better. Uh, we made the new Revised Standard Version uh, in order to make the same words more encompassing uh, for our modern world. Uh, the ancient world did not consider half the population women and another chunk of the population servants or slaves. Uh, to be real parts of the Jewish community or even the early Christian community. So uh, the entire Bible is addressed to and talks about men. Uh, however, we understood that while that language is there, uh, women and slaves and children were all part of these communities. And so the importance was to update scripture from that purely literal way of saying, uh, the men of the village uh, responded to Jesus this way instead of saying the people uh, responded this way. That's the men would be the actual word, but they probably meant all the people. And so scholars uh, created that. So we use what's called the NRSV. Uh, in the second session, you're going to be starting the story of Abraham and Sarah. 
And uh, we can do that by turning, as I just did, uh, to the book of Genesis. And you're going to be in the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis, and you're starting at the 26th verse. Uh, this starts, as do all uh, genealogies and biographies, we all recognize that we're here uh, because our grandparents often made a decision. It's very true in my own life, for example. All four of my grandparents emigrated to Canada from uh, somewhere in the British Isles immediately after World War I. Uh, that meant something. You know, Europe was very disrupted after that four-year war, and a uh, great many ordinary citizens uh, really thought it was time, uh, and if they had the opportunity to do so, wanted to stretch their lives and experience them in a non-European environment. Uh, that's really my family, uh, both with one foot firmly kept back in England and Ireland, where my grandparents are from, and another foot uh, firmly settled here in North America, uh, where we can take those values that we still cherish, uh, but live them out in a different way. Uh, that's not unlike the story you're reading today. Uh, Terah, or Terra, uh, was the father of Abram and Nahor and Haran, uh, and he decided that his family needed to migrate out of a place called Ur, which is in the Tigris-Euphrates valleys uh, in what would today be Iraq. And to move them across the Golden Crescent, you'll find a map in your written session two item articles, uh, to move his family from that Mesopotamian area around toward the Mediterranean Sea in a land that was then called Canaan. Uh, and you'll read about all that story and who were involved in that story in this uh, section of the book of Genesis that we're using for today's uh, reading, the saga of uh, what happened to Abraham and Sarah in the midst of this. Now, Abraham and Sarah set out with Terah on this journey, uh, but about halfway to Canaan, Terah dies. And this leaves uh, the rest of the clan in a real predicament. Uh, it was nowhere in scripture does it say it was Abraham's vision in particular to leave uh, his home region and go with his father, though obviously he did when other members of the extended family did not. Uh, but it was the vision of his father, clearly, that wanted to make this journey. And halfway through, Abraham finds himself with his wife, his nephew, and the various uh, members of the extended family and uh, hangers-on, and they need leadership and guidance. So in this place, he has lost his father to death and must be going through that grieving process must be feeling very uh, dissociated from his extended family who would have grieved and uh, prayed and uh, celebrated uh, his father's life in traditional ways. Uh, he must have felt very alone and with a brand new burden. It's there that God first speaks to Abraham, right in the midst of all of this tension. And it's very important for us in, in today's uh, lesson to start to read about that. Uh, so what we have in the story of Abraham and Sarah is someone, uh, uh, two people who get to know the voice of God. Now, scripture always speaks of the voice of God as coming from without, or at least it, it sounds as though it's coming that way. But um, this is not something, uh, you know, whatever stories we hear from the ancient people can't be different from the stories of the modern world. God didn't sort of stop talking out of clouds all of a sudden and uh, when the Hebrew people were done and, and be silent. Uh, Ab Abraham heard the voice of God the same way uh, modern people hear the voice of God, and that is some people are very attuned to the deep voice within, the voice of the soul. We all hear this voice all the time. Uh, and if you have difficulty understanding that, I like to point out that the character Yoda in the Star Wars uh, movies is saying the same thing. He's saying the, the force is there, 
Uh, the problem is we ignore it most of the time. We don't pay attention to it. We're not listening. And a Jedi Knight is somebody who, yeah, does the exciting thing about learning how to use a lightsaber, but whose real practice is to learn how to uh, pay attention to the Force. This is exactly true of scripture. Uh, we, we do in reality what uh, George Lucas did for us in fantasy, which is we listen for the voice of the rhythm of the spirit alive in the world we share with others. And Abraham did that and heard this voice. Uh, the important thing for Abraham is that he also not only heard the voice, but he was able to separate that voice out from other voices. Uh, you know, the kind of busy voices that we have all the time and the, what Freud called the super ego voices, the ones that are always telling us how we ought to live our lives. Uh, he, Abraham was able to, to separate those out and know that he was hearing an authentic voice of the divine. So we have that on the one hand and a loving uh, wife with whom he was very intimate on the other. I mean, they share all sorts of things. And while Sarah was not this kind of person, she couldn't hear the voice of God as deeply within. She comprehended it and understood it as she shared her life with Abraham. On the other hand in this story, I hope you'll hear that Abraham and Sarah live very real lives, make very real decisions, uh, some of which uh, we will find maybe a little shocking or disturbing. So uh, here we are, you're going to wend your way through the first uh, few chapters that tell us the story of Abraham and Sarah. And I'd like to think that you will hear both a, a married couple that are going to hear the voice of God and a married couple that are making their way uh, into a whole new uh, pilgrimage of life into Canaan and need to uh, provide uh, for their security, their economic development, their, their family life, and their extended family life. It's all here, and have fun uh, reading it and talking about it in this session. Take care, God bless, and have fun with the meeting.